This morning, Matthew is where we are, Matthew chapter 12. It's where we've been for the most of last year and all of this year so far. And I'm going to tell you, after last week, I went back and listened to the message. I went back and, and kind of thought about it, and I let the Lord speak to me through the message. And, and, and over the past week, I've talked to some other pastors, and some other things have come to my mind. And, and uh, I just want to make sure that we know uh, and, and make sure that I explain it to you as best I know how, uh, that, you know, sometimes I get excited, and sometimes it's not a bad thing. But I just want to make sure that if any time, at any point, that I get up here to start preaching on my opinion or start preaching on my preferences or anything, that somebody will call me out on it. I hope it didn't come off that way last week, but this political situation that we're going through kind of gets me a little bit heated sometimes. And uh, hopefully I was, hopefully what you guys understood and, and what a, what we all got out of last week's message was uh, completely biblical and completely spiritual. And if it wasn't, you have an opportunity to think about it and you go, Lee, you know, call me out on it. I'm not, I'm not too big to be called out on anything because, I mean, just because I'm the pastor doesn't mean I'm perfect and I'm okay with it. I'm okay with being called out. I'd rather you do that than you sit around and think about it and, and me do something I shouldn't be doing. So, uh, Sometimes we as pastors, as you probably heard from just not just me, we get on our soapbox every now and then, and sometimes we can let things slip that don't need to be there. So uh, that's just my apology to you. Uh, but this morning I, got, I, I, was, I was given this word from the Lord about hope. And in Matthew 12, verse 15 is where we're going to be, 15 through 21, just a small little chunk of this passage. Uh, we're going to see about hope this morning. I'm so excited about it. So if you've got a Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 12, verse 15. And just like we talked about last week, Jesus has been on the heels of, 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 of a confrontation with the Pharisees. Uh, there were some things that were going on. The, you know, the disciples were walking through the grain field. They picked some grain. The Pharisees didn't like it because it happened on the Sabbath, and they were all concerned about Sabbath law. And then they tried to corner Jesus in the synagogue and tried to catch him and, and trying to heal somebody whether it was right or wrong to heal on the sabbath and in the midst of all this the last verse there in verse 14 is that they conspired to try to destroy jesus in my translation i know this may not be completely accurate but that was the the thing behind it that's the gist behind that verse is they the pharisees left there wanting to destroy jesus and his ministry because it went against everything that they believed in and so understanding that, moving into this next verse, in verse 15, it says this. Jesus aware of this. That's what he's aware of. He knows that they're conspiring against him. He knows that they're trying to destroy him. He knows that the, the Pharisees are probably going to take this to the high council and probably do whatever they can to get rid of him. And as we read throughout the rest of the gospel, we know that that's the case, and that's what ends up happening. But at this moment, I want you to see what Jesus does in the midst of the conflict and the opposition that he has. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. And many followed him. And I just want you to know, it wasn't that his purpose was that everybody follow him. I want to stop for a minute. We're going to preach kind of through this first part of this passage, and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it for a minute. But as he, as he left there, Jesus' uh, purpose that we believe is not that he would just take everybody and go somewhere else and, and get away from the Pharisees. Jesus wanted to get away by himself. We see this several times in the Gospels where Jesus just needs to get away sometimes and go pray and be by himself. I can imagine the, just the human side of him. If you've got crowds and crowds of people pushing against you all the time, wanting miracles and wanting to be healed as they're doing this, you probably get to the point where you get weary and you get tired. Even though he was fully God, he was fully man, and I'm sure there were times where he just wanted to be by himself. I don't know about y'all, but I experienced a little bit of this, not, not even close to what Jesus experienced, but the frustration of, and y'all might have been there before, the frustration of wanting to focus on something, wanting to do something, and, and you, just, you just can't get to a spot where you're just completely alone, and, and you, just, you have all the cares and everything that wants to take away your time just kind of melts away. And see, for us in our house, uh, this happened to me Friday, and it got me so irritated. 
And I did go, okay, I kept my cool. Um, if Stacy's watching, she can comment on that. We'll see uh, what she says about it. But uh, I thought I kept my cool. Um, but normally during the week, uh, I have an opportunity to be home by myself, and I can work on what I need to work on. I can work on my message, and a lot of times I have to get myself to a quiet place, or I have to, you know, maybe just put on a little background noise, but but it, just a place where I can focus just on what God's want me to do and, and, and work and whatnot. And so this week was just one of these weird weeks where I never have a chance to do anything during the week, and so Friday was my day to do it. And Friday evening, we didn't have anything to do. I cooked supper, I put a pot of chili on early so they wouldn't have to worry about cooking supper, and then I sat down at the kitchen table because that's my only place to kind of sprawl out and kind of, you know, study. Well, if you know anything about our little house, we've got a little mill house. It's four rooms, and the bathroom's kind of on the back, but the house, every room is connected. So as I sit in the kitchen, the boys' room is to the right of me, and the living room is to the left of me as I sit sort of at the table. I can see the television. I can hear their Xbox or whatever they're playing on. I can hear that in here. And as I'm sitting there trying to focus, I've got two dogs at one side of me, and i got the pig over here. Because what they understand, if you're sitting at the table, you're doing what? You're eating. So, so they have figured out, if I'm sitting at the table, I'm eating. Now, they know this because when I'm sitting at the table eating, when nobody else is home, what I usually do is, you know, I'm, I have compassion for my animals, and I slip them a little something from the table. Well, they don't know any different. If they see me sitting there, they think we're getting something. So if you can imagine, as I'm trying to focus, and I've got a TV in here. It's not very loud, but I can just see it out of the corner of my eye. And I've got... The boys on their Xboxes doing whatever they're doing in there. And I've got a pig that's rooting on my leg here. And when I say rooting on my leg, he will pick my leg clean up off the ground trying to get something. And I got one dog that's scratching the hound out of me over here trying to get something over here. And then the other one just lays at my feet. So you can imagine Friday, I was not in the best of moods when it comes to really trying to focus. And then, of course, it was, Dad, fix me something to eat. And then Stacy needed something, and she called from the kitchen, living room to ask me for something. And I finally got to the point where I just went to the bathroom with my iPad and just had to sit there for a minute until somebody come knocking on the door. Dad, hurry up. I got to go. I got to go. I got to go, because we only have the one bathroom. And so by Friday evening, I'd already been up early that morning. I had to go into work early. So about Friday evening, about 8 o'clock, I'd about had enough. And I just said, you know what? I'm going to bed. And I'll get up early Saturday morning and try to, when nobody else is up, and try to, to deal with it. And then that's what I ended up doing. But it's just the fact, you ever been there to that point, it just gets you so frustrated that you can't even think straight, that you can't even focus on anything you're doing. And see, Jesus was at this point after he just had this confrontation with the Pharisees. He was at a point to where he just needed to get away from, from everything. He just needed a minute to where he could focus on his own thoughts. He could pray where he could just get away from the situation. And yet we see there in verse 15 that they followed him. And the crowd followed him. And it wasn't his purpose. It was just to get away from the conflict. But notice what Jesus did. It says there, and he healed them all. Jesus had compassion. Even in the midst of frustration, he had compassion over the people. And it says here, Matthew says, he healed them all. He took time to be with each one of them. And then in verse 16, he says he ordered them not to make him known. Now, Jesus kind of knew. We've already seen this in the Bible. Every time Jesus says this, it, normally the people don't listen. But the thing we need to see here from Jesus is that he wanted everybody to keep this quiet. Not so that there weren't more people coming. It's just the more that people talked, the more he knew the Pharisees would be right there. And he was trying to explain to them, hey, if you'll just keep this quiet, just let, let's not make any of this known just so that we can keep the peace, per se. Because Jesus did not want any of this conflict to come back up. And then that's all we get of this exchange right here. And then Matthew shows us something. In these short two verses, 15 and 16, 
Matthew then shows us about a prophecy that's fulfilled. So verse 17. says, This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings victory to justice. And his, in his name, the Gentiles will hope. Now, look at this passage just for a second and see that Matthew, again, he breaks it down into two parts. There's the physical act of Jesus withdrawing, getting away from the conflict, moving away from the Pharisees and the opposition that he faced. And then there's this prophecy that Matthew drops in here. And as we see, it's not... You know, most of the prophecy is that he's going to come. He's going to be the Messiah. He's going to, you know, he's going to be born of a virgin. He's, you know, there's, there's these, these massive prophecies that say something great about who Jesus is. And yet there's this prophecy here that all Jesus did was, was get away. All Jesus did was withdraw. And yet there's prophecy written in Isaiah about a servant who's going to do this. So what, what, what did Jesus do? What, what Jesus did in the response to the conflict of the Pharisees is this. There's three things I want you to see this morning. And then we're going to look at the prophecy and we're going to put it all together. But I want us just to focus on verse 15 and 16 just for a second and see what Jesus did. First thing is that he withdrew. He withdrew and got out of there. And, and what we see from that, just that small, simple act of him, of him realizing the opposition that he was in and then deciding not to confront the opposition, not to confront the conflict, but yet move away, was that he had a non-confrontational attitude. He chose that. He chose to withdraw, withdraw from what was going on. He removed himself from the conflict. Now, think about this for just a second. Jesus could have easily easily called the pharisees out he could have easily went back at their at their you know i mean as soon as he heard the pharisees say they were trying to destroy him he could have went after them he could have tore them down he could have made them feel so small because this is the god of the universe this is jesus he had all the right answers he understood he could see into their heart he knew all these things how easy could it have been just to stop everything right there? I mean, think about some of the things that we've seen Jesus do in the Gospels. Uh, just, just like they're trying to catch him and his disciples on this Sabbath law. They're trying to catch him in any little thing they can. They're trying to find sin in somebody who has no sin. Remember what Jesus did when they brought the, uh, the adulterous woman out and they were going to stone her and, and Jesus went and knelt down and rode in the sand and, and everybody just started walking away. Most commentators believe then he started to write their sins in the sand. Think about what Jesus could have done here. Jesus could have called out each one of these Pharisees. He could have called out their dark heart. He could have called out their sins to the point to where this conflict was gone. It was, it was done. But Jesus didn't do that. Jesus withdrew and chose a non-confrontational attitude. Notice that if you go back and look at verse 10 uh, in, 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 in Matthew, in verses 14 and verse 23... You see, Jesus instructed his disciples to do this. When, we were, uh, when, when, when the message was about being a sent out Christian and we were talking about being sent out, he instructed the disciples, if anyone doesn't receive you, listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave their house or town. I'm talking about just you don't stay there and be a confrontation uh, about, about what's going on. You move, you leave. Uh, verse 23 says, when they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. So he's explaining to the disciples Sometimes when conflict arises, it's best just to leave. It's best just to move away. And so he withdrew and chose this non-confrontational attitude. Number two is he showed a gentle spirit. Even though he could have sent all the people away. Even though he could have told this crowd of people, get away from me, I just need to be a minute alone, I just got to get out of here. He showed a gentle spirit and showed a patient ministry of encouragement rather than calling out the Pharisees. Again, he could have went and called them out. He could have went and, 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 and just tore them, tore into them, and just, and just ended it right there. 
But Jesus decided to move away from man, and when the people came to him, he had compassion on them. He understood the mission at hand, and he was gentle with them. You see, I don't know about you, but when I get into the middle of a confrontation, when I get into the middle of conflict, something happens to me. I get nervous. I get my blood pressure rises up a little bit. My heart starts beating. I, I can't really control my mouth, my, my internal filter that's not really good anyway kind of just completely goes away and I start to say things that I probably shouldn't say and I don't really mean. And I just get in this, this mode. You get in this fight mode, right? You get in this, this mode of, you know, just I, I clench my fist and I just, I, I don't want to leave until it's over. You see, when we get into that situation, we don't show a gentle spirit anymore and we definitely don't keep our mind on the mission that's at hand. You see, Jesus, in the midst of this confrontation, moved away from there. He got cooled down, but when he saw the people coming, he still had a gentleness of heart. He still had compassion, and he healed them all rather than going after the Pharisees. And then number three, he asked the crowd to keep his privacy. Now, again, we, we don't know if they did. We, more than likely, they probably didn't. But just the fact that he asked them to do this shows us that he wanted to make sure that he stayed clear of the conflict. Because the one thing that he wanted to do, and I believe his motive in telling them this, is that he didn't want there to start being little murmurs around the community, around Galilee there where he's doing this. He didn't want things to be said so that the Pharisees could track it their way back to him. O ultimately, we're going to see in the next couple of verses, they're going to find him again. And there's going to be another confrontation. And we'll look at that a little bit in depth next week. But notice right here, he just wants to be left alone. He doesn't want that. He wants to just say, hey, y'all be quiet about this. Let's just let's keep it down. And, and that way I can, I, can, I can just steer clear of the confrontation. I don't have to worry about the conflict. You see, sometimes that's what we have to do in our own lives. Sometimes we have to, when we're in the midst of conflict and, 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 and we're, 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 we're getting really keyed up about it. Sometimes our, our attitude wants to go to talking about the person or go to talk about what's going on or, or, or just to keep it going. And what we see here is Jesus, he didn't want to keep it going. He healed them. He showed compassion over them. But he needed a space. And it's almost to say in this verse, Jesus just dropped it. He said, we're done with it until they come back. So, now... Knowing that about what we saw Jesus do, knowing this about what we actually saw him do in these, in these two verses, let's look at this, this prophecy for a minute because what this is going to show, just in these two verses, he fulfills prophecy to the point where Matthew, again, is showing that he is the Messiah, showing that he is the Son of God. So let's go back and look at verse 17. He says, this was for, to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. This was actually Isaiah uh, 42, uh, verses 1 through 4. That's where this comes from. And, and, and this is in the midst of, of Isaiah and the prophecy. Uh, in, in, in 41, I think, 40, 41, through I think about 55 in Isaiah, uh, the prophecy there is about a servant. Uh, some of it's about a suffering servant. If you, if you know, uh, there's part of, part of it is, you know, by his wounds we are healed. Uh, that, that sort of prophecy is in there. But, but we start to see this prophecy of a servant. And Matthew wants to show us through that prophecy of Isaiah, we see who Jesus really is. So verse 18, we get this. Behold my servant, who we understand is Jesus. This is, this is the prophecy is speaking towards Jesus, my servant. Jesus, whom I have chosen. Now again here, Isaiah is, is prophesying from God's perspective. And so what we're hearing here is this is my servant, Jesus, whom I have chosen. This is spoken words from, from God. My beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. Again, if you go back and you think about Matthew, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 17, in the middle of the baptism, uh, when Jesus was coming up out of the water, that's what God placed on Jesus. He said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. So again, we see this, this just, just this verse alone we see here that God has blessed his son, his servant that has come to earth, that is the Messiah. 
And the reason that's so important is that we get to see through these little actions exactly who Jesus is. He says, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. Verse 19, he will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. Notice there's that verse there, just seeing back, going back to what we've already seen Jesus do. Just in this one confrontation with the Pharisees, just his, his, his demeanor, the peaceful, gentleness demeanor that he had, he was able to come and fulfill just this prophecy alone. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the street. Again, just that asking the people not to speak of what is going on uh, fulfills this prophecy here in verse 19. And then we get to verse 20. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. You see, this was showing. Matthew was showing again his readers. Remember, this book is written to a group of Jewish people. This is written to the, to the Jewish church in the first century. And they would have understood the Old Testament. They would have understood the prophecy. They would have understood all these things. And Matthew is trying to show them who Jesus is. We've seen this from the time we first opened Matthew to the time for, till right now when we're in chapter 12. We see Matthew continues to show these people this is the Messiah. And verse 19 shows that Jesus' behavior is in line with the prophecy that Isaiah shows that he won't quarrel or cry loud in the streets. And then in verse 20, notice, notice this. If you go back and look at, at this sermon series that we're in right now, you go back and you study chapter 11 up until where we are right now, there have been three sets of opposition that have come against Jesus. The first one being his friend, John the Baptist. The second one was his own people in Capernaum and Bethsaida and that, those people who had seen him do miracles and signs and wonders, but yet they wouldn't repent. They saw the opposition. He saw the opposition from that. And then now he's getting opposition from the Pharisees, the religious leaders. But notice here what verse 20 says. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles... Well, hope. Well, notice first, all of these people that he has had conflict with up until this point are not Gentiles. All these people that he's come into contact with are supposed to be God's people, the ones looking for the Messiah. These are the Hebrews. These are God's chosen people looking for the Messiah. And yet in, in just one and a half chapters we've seen so far in chapters 11 and 12, we start to see that the biggest opposition and the biggest conflict that Jesus has doesn't come from the Gentiles who aren't even looking for the Messiah, but it comes from his own people. We start to see the opposition come. And so when he says a bruised wheat reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not quench, who he's talking about here is he's talking about the rest of the world. And when he says the Gentiles, in his name the Gentiles will hope, he's talking about the rest of the world. And he's trying to show them through this prophecy. Jesus is showing them. Matthew's showing them who Jesus is because a broken reed, what he's talking about there is a reed with a long sort of stick, if you can imagine, sort of kind of like bamboo, kind of in a, in a sense. And they would use a reed for, for a lot of different things, but one of the things that they would use a reed for is to measure things. They would cut a reed at a certain, so many cubits or so, many, uh, so, so much height or whatever, and they would use it to measure things. And you can imagine that after some time, that reed would get bent up, or it'd get broken or it'd get bruised and, and it wouldn't be as straight as it normally would be. And so what would happen as soon as that reed was no longer good anymore, it was cast out. It was thrown away. And a lot of times they were broken and thrown into the fire. And then a smoldering wick, this imagery that Isaiah is showing us through Matthew. A smoldering wick he will not quench. It was like if you've ever looked at a, a candle... And it's getting down to the end. And, and it, it can barely just keep its, keep its flame. Or it's, it's sitting there flickering because it's getting ready to go out. Or, or you look at a fire 
that's, that's getting ready to go out and it just sits there and smolders. There's no flame anymore, but it's on its last leg. It still has a little bit of heat, but it's just not what it used to be. And you can imagine the, the lamps that they were using as far as this, this analogy goes in their day. A smoldering wick would have been a wick on an oil lamp. And right there toward the end of it, I don't know if any of you have ever seen an oil lamp. Most of you probably have. Um, if you go to Cracker Barrel, you've seen them sometimes. I don't know, do they use those anymore? They do sometimes. I know some used to that you could you could actually, they would, sometimes they'd light it. I don't know. Maybe they just never let, lit them at my table because they knew that, you know, I'd knock them over and place the catch place on fire. But anyway, I remember my grandfather, my great-grandfather had an oil lamp. And I remember we, we you know, we'd sneak in there to play with it. And, uh, you know, not something that I would have my kids playing with today. You probably shouldn't have been playing with it when I was my age, but it was just fun to sit there and watch the wick. We'd, we'd take it all the way up, we'd bring it all the way back down, we'd play with it and everything. And then I'll never forget one day, he come in there and he lit it. And we're like, oh, you know. And we were just amazed at it, just this, this wick. But I remember he would, we would sit there and play with it. He got ready to, to, to put it out. And I remember we were sitting there playing with it. And we took the, the wick all the way down as far as it would go. We started playing this little game. We wanted to see how far we could get it to go before it went out. And as you would get it closer and closer to the end, we started noticing it would smolder and it would smoke a little bit. And then we could get it to quench the, 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 the fire. But that's the kind of the thing that, that Matthew's talking about here is he's talking about these people was like a smoldering wick at the end of its life where it still had just a little bit of fire. There was still, still a little bit of flame and it was starting to smolder a little bit. There was a little bit of smoke coming off of it to kind of give you an idea that it was getting ready to end. But notice what it says here that in this prophecy that Jesus will not do. A smoldering wick he will not quench. You see, what this prophecy is saying about Jesus is he's saying, look, he's starting to see his opposition is his own people. And he's showing us, Matthew's showing these, 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 these Jewish people that are reading this book for the first time. He's saying that Jesus didn't just come for you. The Messiah wasn't just here for you, but he's come for everybody. That he is going to give the Gentiles hope. Imagine being a, a Jewish reader in the first century and hearing this. You know, they still had issue with the Gentiles. They were still half-breeds to them. They were still people they didn't want to associate with. And here we see that this prophecy is showing that Jesus is going to bring hope to the Gentiles. That even the broken people of this world, as he says here with the bruised reed and the smoldering wick, these are the damaged and the vulnerable, the broken people of this world Jesus is going to show compassion for. And so what does he do when he moves away and he withdraws himself away from this conflict and this opposition as the people come, these broken and vulnerable people who are looking for hope, who are looking for healing, what does he do? He continues the mission and he has compassion on them. And what Matthew tells us here is that he healed them all. See, Jesus shows his character and compassion as the Messiah and brings victory and hope to the hopeless. That's what Matthew was trying to show here with this prophecy that he was, in fact, the Messiah, that he was, in fact, here to bring hope to the hopeless, not just to the Jew, but also to the Gentile. And so now I, I want to ask you this. As we see this and we understand the prophecy, we understand what Matthew's trying to do to show us that Jesus is the true Messiah. He is the answer. Let's bring it back to us and what we can glean from this. What can we apply to this this morning? So my question is to you, what do you do? When opposition and conflict come, what do you do? Tell you what I do most times. I run to it. I run after it because I'm stubborn and I'm a man. I'm not saying that that just makes us stubborn, but you know, most women would agree that you share anything. Well, I won't put you on the spot. 
My wife's not here to ask that question. I know what the answer is. Most of you do. But when conflict arises, when we face opposition, I tend to be stubborn because, you know, and Stacy can tell you this happens with me and Brockman all the time. Brockman is just, just exactly like me. Um, bless his poor heart. But he got this attitude for me. He has to have the last word. He's got to be right. He's got to win. And any time the two of us get together to have even just a, just a casual conversation, nine times out of ten it ends in this conflict of, you know, one talking over the other. We can't, either get, we can't even get a word in. And usually it ends up in Stacy telling us both to be quiet. Where, of course, as the stubborn man that I am, I speak up because I'm the father. I get the last word, and I usually get reprimanded for it probably worse than he does. But that's just the way that I deal with conflict and opposition. Sometimes I go after it. Because most time, in the way I was raised, and not the way I was raised, I'm not going to put my mama down like that. My mama did everything. Mama and daddy both did everything they could. They just couldn't help that I got the genes I did because I'm just like my grandpa. I love my grandpa to death, but he was right until he died. You didn't fight that man. You didn't argue with that man. You, you just, yes, Papa, and went on with it. And I'm the same way. But it's just this thought of thinking about who we are and what we do when opposition comes. Because as I've been studying this over this weekend and, and, and over the last couple of days, it's really got me to thinking back even on some things that have happened here recently at work or, or at home or wherever. And I've had opposition or conflict come up. And then as I was studying this, it really got me thinking about these two things. You see, the reason that Jesus chose to withdraw from conflict was, I believe, because it was twofold. There were two things he did that I really believe that we can, we can take away from this. Is number one, he knew the greater mission of the gospel. Notice what he did when those people followed him as he withdrew. The, he healed them all. He understood that the greater mission was to, to show the world his power through healing these people, was to show that he was the Messiah through healing these people and, and being compassionate and loving. Because when we think about it, what good would it have done him at that time to go against the Pharisees, to go after the Pharisees, to show them that he was right? Would that have furthered the gospel? I don't know if it would have in that situation, which is the reason why Jesus chose to withdraw from it. And the second thing is he recognized the Spirit. He recognized when the Spirit was telling him it's time to move, it was time to have a spirit of gentleness, when it's time to have a spirit of love or compassion. He recognized and listened to the Spirit. So I, when we're faced with opposition, I want us to ask us two questions based off of what we've seen from Jesus. Based off of what we see here, there's two questions that I think we're faced with. And the first one is this. Will you continuing to pursue this conflict would, excuse me, continuing to pursue this conflict be beneficial to the gospel? You see, when we're in the middle of conflict, it's something that we need to start training ourselves and teach. And, and the more that we dive into Scripture, the more that we get close to the Holy Spirit, the more that we abide in Him, the, the easier this will be. But it's asking ourselves a question. When that conflict arises, when we have that one-on-one -on -one confrontation with, with a spouse or with somebody at work or, or somebody on Facebook, ask that question. Is this honestly going to keep the, the continuation of the gospel? Is it going to help me to pursue the gospel? Because, see, a lot of times when we have conflict with people, a lot of people that we have conflict with may or may not know who Jesus is. And our continuing to choose conflict over withdrawn from the situation may have a detrimental effect on them hearing the gospel. Because what if you are the only gospel that they are to, to see? What if the only person that they know that goes to church, that knows who Jesus is that, is, that is, that is a Christian, that is a follower of Jesus, what if you are the only person that they know? 
And in a moment of, of, of just heated conflict, in a moment of I got to be right, or in a moment of I can't believe they said that about me or they're doing this to me, I choose to pursue the conflict instead of pursuing the gospel. How many times would that change a relationship if we just decided to withdraw from the conflict instead of pursuing the conflict? You see, I just want to remind you of this. And it's something that I was reminded of this week. Is that when judgment comes, and we're standing there in front of God Almighty, and he, we're giving an account of our life, Listen, it's not going to matter how many times we were right. It's not going to matter how many times we were right in that argument with somebody or how many times that we chose to make a stand on something that had nothing to do with the gospel. It was just for the sake of conflict's sake. No, it's not going to matter. The only thing that's going to matter is how we respond to the gospel at that moment. And I don't know about you, but I can't even fathom the thought of being there, having to, to give an account of my life. And we come to a point in, in, in our lives where, where Jesus is showing us, where God is showing us that, that we chose conflict over the gospel. That we chose to be right over showing somebody the love and compassion of Jesus. I would hate more than anything to know that my mistake, that my, that my pursuing conflict meant that that person didn't know the love and compassion of Jesus. You see, we've got to ask ourselves that question. Would continuing to pursue this conflict be beneficial to the gospel? And the second thing is, what is the tone of my attitude? What's my spirit? It's another way to put that. How's my attitude? You see, I can almost tell you when I have trouble with conflict, and you probably can too, when you have trouble with opposition, that normally going into it, you've already got an attitude of we're getting ready to fight. It's just time to go. It's time to throw down. You've already formulated in your head, it was funny, I seen a, a book this week. It was actually a journal, and, and I thought to myself, I need this because it's so me. But it's, it's when you're in the midst of, 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 of just knowing that you're going to see this person. And I don't know how many of you do this. I do this a lot. It's like you'll be in the shower, and you have this hypothetical conversation in your head about what's getting ready to take place. And if they say this, I'm going to say this. And if they bring this up, I'm going to bring this up. And if they do this, I'm going to do this. I've won every single hypothetical argument I've ever had in the shower. Or wherever I'm at. I want them all. But can I tell you something? In the midst of that conflict, they've never come up. Those have never happened. It's always been something worse. Or it's always been something that I wasn't expecting. Or it's always been because my attitude wasn't right. See, instead of me trying to ask God to change my attitude and change the tone of my spirit, instead, I, I, we, we, we automatically go to, okay, what can I do to make it right? What can I do to be right in this situation? What can I do to win this fight? But I believe what Jesus wants us to understand this morning is it all has to do with our spirit. It all has to do with our attitude. And as followers of Christ, we have access to the Holy Spirit. And as I told you before, if we have access to the Holy Spirit and we glean from Him and we study a God's Word and we hear these things, we, we can train our spirit. We can train the flesh. We can beat it down in moments like this where the, the Holy Spirit comes out. And who is the Spirit? I, I want to I I show you the... But, but Jesus had an attitude, a spirit of gentleness and self-control and compassion just in what's happening here. Just in this one passage, we see that. His attitude of compassion and gentleness and self-control. But notice in Paul's writings, I'm going to throw out a couple of scripture here. So most of these are in First and Second Timothy as he's teaching Timothy uh, to be a a pastor and an overseer and a deacon as he's teaching the church how, how to be these things, to be these men of God, we see this in their attitude. I want you to see this. 1 Timothy 6, 11. He says this, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. 
Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. He says in, in 1 Timothy 2.17, For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and what? Self-control. 2 Timothy 2, uh, this is verse 23 through 26. I want you to listen to this. Having nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies, it's almost as if Paul wrote this for today, you know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. This Just in this description of what Paul is telling Timothy that these men need to be is, is notice there, they don't breed quarrels. They're not quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, patiently enduring evil. Notice the patience and correcting their opponents with gentleness. You see, there's these attitudes. Again, you see here, just in Paul, it's writing to Timothy. And then go back, and most of you know this by heart, but Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it's the fruit of the Spirit. Notice what some of them are. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. You see, I think the most important thing that we can take away from what we see Jesus do in this conflict when he's dealing with this opposition is that his attitude was that of gentleness, self-control, love, and patience. You see, because when we really, really get down to the heart of it, when we really get down to the meat of what's going on here, we understand this, that what happens daily... What happens to us daily, the conflicts that we see ourselves in, the opposition that we get from wherever it's coming from, we understand this, that these are ch chances. These are chances for us to show the world who we are as a follower of Christ. And what Jesus showed us just in this passage alone, as he deals with this opposition and conflict, as he withdrew from it, and he focused on the matter at hand, and he focused on the mission of the gospel, and he showed compassion and love, we need to show the same thing. We need to have a spirit of gentleness, self-control, love, and patience. How many people have that these days? How many people talk about self-control these days? You notice that the world is not talking about these things. They may talk about love. You might hear something said about gentleness. But for the most part, that's not the way the world works anymore. The way the world works nowadays is it's all about me. And if you do anything to keep me from being me or keep me from doing me, if you try to come at me and oppose me, then I have a right to lash back at you and, and to tell you you're wrong. Or I have the, the right to, to protest any way I see fit. Or I have the right to, 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 to speak my mind and speak my voice. I have the right to say, because of a of, of First Amendment right, to say whatever it is I want to say. Whether it hurts you or not, I have the right to do that. And the world is telling people today that it's okay to do that. That when conflict arises, you fight back. You take a stand. You don't back down from anybody. There were times when Jesus did that, yes. We'll see that as toward the end of the gospel. He, 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 he did go against the Pharisees. And he didn't back down. And he showed them who he truly was. And it may have taken a resurrection to do it, but he did it. But as followers of Christ in 2021, in the middle of January, that it already is, 
crazy how fast it's going by. We need to have a spirit of gentleness and self-control and love and patience. These attributes and attitudes of Christ should be overflowing from our spirit. You see, the church has no business getting in the middle of conflict and opposition. Now, I want you to hear me. I'm not saying that we should lay down on our beliefs or, 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 or what, we, what we believe is true and our theology and our doctrine. No, I'm not saying that. We stand firm and we hold to that. But conflict for conflict's sake, opposition for opposition's sake, arguing over something that ultimately in the, in the grand scheme of everything that is going on for the gospel in this world, it doesn't matter. That's what I'm talking about. Because if we look at who Jesus was, if we really focus on who Jesus was, even in the midst of standing up for him, for himself, even in the midst of standing up for his followers, even in the midst of standing up for Christianity, we see it with Paul, we see it with Peter, we see it with John, we see it with the disciples in Acts as they further the church. We see, yes, that they stood up with boldness, but they still had an attitude of gentleness and self-control and love and patience. You see, it's who we need to be in the midst of conflict. So that's my question this morning to you. How's your spirit this morning? Is there a conflict that you know is going to rise this week at work? Is there a family member that you know that you might come into contact with and it's not going to be pretty, but, but I'm going to stand up and I'm going to fight? Is there somebody on Facebook who just keeps commenting at you and keeps picking at you and they want to cause a fight? If I see them comment or post on this one thing one more time, I'm going to lose my mind and I'm just going to tell them how it is. Maybe the Lord's trying to tell you this morning that it's gentleness, self-control, love and patience that you need instead of trying to show that you're right. Father God, I thank you so much this morning for allowing us to be here again. God, thank you for giving us the example of who Jesus is. Thank you for showing us through the gospel that we get to see that not only was he the Messiah, but we get to see how he interacted and how he acted and, and how he dealt with conflict and opposition. That ultimately, it was about hope. Ultimately, it was those broken reeds and those smoldering wicks, the vulnerable and the, and the damaged people that you saved because you had love and compassion on them. Father, to us that sit here under the sound of your voice this morning as your spirit moves, that realize that we were just as damaged and vulnerable. And that, God, you came to love us and you had compassion over us. Jesus, you died for us to show us how much you love us. Father, may we really seriously think about that this week. As we all know that we're going to go throughout our week and there may be some conflict that arises. There may be opposition that we face. Father, remind us. It's not about being right. It's not about winning an argument. It's about compassion and love and showing others the same compassion and love you showed us. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, we were in conflict with you. Our sin is in conflict with you. And yet you chose death on cross. And resurrecting on the third day to have power over that sin. To cover my sin 
to cover my opposition with your blood. Not so that I may walk this world and be brash and brazen and want to fight at every turn. But Jesus, you did that so that I may see compassion, so that I may know what true love is about, so that I may know a gentleness when I keep falling and I keep stumbling, that we may know a gentleness and a love that we can show to others, that we can extend to the rest of this world. Because, Lord, you know right now they don't see it. The only place this world is going to see that kind of gentleness and love and compassion and, and understanding is from you. And, Father, we pray this morning that you let us be the lights to shine that. Father, we love you and thank you for this opportunity that you give us to be here today to hear you. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Guys, I love you. Thank you guys for being here this morning. I do want to mention something on uh, as I'm still live on Facebook before I leave. I mentioned, was going to mention it during our, our announcements and forgot about it, but I want to make sure that I uh, share this because... I miss seeing her. I know she's usually over there, but happy birthday, Miss Donna. Um, I won't tell anybody your age, even though you're 23. Um, but, you know, we won't go in there. But, uh, Miss Donna, we miss you. And it's like we miss everybody um, that, that is not here. Um, but we just want to let you know that we love you. Uh, and happy birthday. I hope you have a wonderful day today. And, and also, uh, for those that are online with us, um, again, we thank you for being with us. Uh, we miss you and, and hope that you will be with us soon. Um, thank you guys again for being here. We love you, and we will uh, we'll, we'll see you again next week. Y'all have a great day. <laughs>